right, great. Our next speaker is Christina Leggett um, from Hebrew University in Caltech. She's going to talk about accuracy first, even though this is the last talk, sadly, for the, for the workshop. But, um, this is, you know, the workshop priorities are different. Accuracy is last for us, but yeah. is last. All right, great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for this really interesting workshop. Thanks to all the organizers and to everyone at Simons for making this happen. Uh, so I, the motivation for this talk is, as we all, oh, so first I should say, this is joint work with folks at Penn, Seth Neal, Aaron Roth, Bo Wagner, Stephen Wu. Uh, we'll appear at NIPS. Uh, the motivation for this talk is that, as we all know, lots of interesting things these days happen on individuals' potentially sensitive data. So, you know, it's, you know, how does Facebook decide what to, what to show us? How does Google steer our attention? How do the ads that we see get, get chosen? You know, how do we get online driving directions? How do we get product recommendations? How is it decided whether or not we get a loan? And, you know, many, many things. Right. And it's just sort of this, this flood of interesting things being done with our potentially uh, personal information. And there are a lot of reasons why we might care about privacy. And we've heard earlier this week that we you know, maybe even instead of saying privacy, should say robustness or stability, but I'll say privacy for the purposes of this talk. But so why, why should we care about privacy? And um, beyond our interest in robustness and stability, um, there, there's privacy for, in some sense, privacy's sake. So privacy for legal or regulatory requirements, privacy to avoid getting in trouble and having your hands on data that you don't want to have, either because you're worried about leaks or subpoenas, uh, privacy uh, for the purposes of sort of brand identity or public perception, which is maybe what we see um, in some applications of the differential privacy technology. Uh, but for, for many reasons, uh, we might be interested in imposing a robustness, stability, privacy type of guarantee on our computations. Um, and in some cases, it's really privacy first, or we might hope that it would be privacy first, or robustness first, or stability first. Uh, that the, we have a sort of well understood, in some sense, literature at this point talking about when you have a privacy requirement that's binding, or a stability requirement that's binding for your computation, um, how can we go about minimally impacting the accuracy of the computation? And Sometimes that's the environment that you're really in, um, where privacy is first. But in other cases, it's really not. Um, and I think in many situations, it's not that we come with a privacy or a stability requirement for a computation, but we have maybe an accuracy requirement for a computation. And privacy is nice if we can get it. And so in this work, we're looking at that side of the question. So how can we understand the best privacy or stability guarantees that we can give for algorithms subject to accuracy goals? And so we've already seen the differential privacy in this workshop, but I'll just do a quick recap to remind us of what is the stability notion that we'll be talking about. And then hi, you're all familiar, I assume, with empirical risk minimization. <coughs> But I'll just mention that there's been very nice work that's been done in sort of the privacy first or stability first perspective on, uh, on ERM. And then I'll talk about uh, how do we go about thinking more accuracy first. So what do we mean when we say privacy or stability here? So sort of informally, the, the goal is uh, to say that access to the results of my computation shouldn't let anybody learn much more about somebody than they could have learned if we'd done the same analysis submitting that individual for the database. And so you know, we've, we've seen this before, so just go quickly through so the intuition here. So if we have some you know, true computation that we want to do on a data set, then we think about sort of randomizing in some sense. And you know, sort of intuitively, what we're going to do is we're going to induce a distribution over the outcome space that is hopefully well concentrated around the, the correct answer, but um, has a little bit of spread to it. And, and the promise that we would like to get for an individual is that if you were to leave the database, then no outcome would change probability by very much. So this is a property of that mapping from database space to outcome space, a stability property. Um, and so formally, the differential privacy model is a statistical database model where we're thinking about a database as formed of entries from some set of possible rows, 
one row per person. And the analyst wants to compute on such a database and preserve the privacy of individuals. So we want to design some randomized algorithm that's going to map from database space into outcome space to mask small changes in the underlying input database. And so what do we mean when I say small changes? <coughs> the, the usual notion here is that we want to require nearly identical behavior on databases that differ by the addition or removal of a single row. And so given that, we can talk about this stability property of a computation, which is just to say that for any pair of neighboring data sets, D and D prime, and for any subset of the outcome space that you might be interested in, the probability that your algorithm will map the first database into that subset of the outcome space is going to be very close in this differential privacy, so nearness, nearness sense, uh, to the probability that we'll see an outcome in that subset uh, under the neighboring database D prime. And you know, so we think about this as being some small uh, multiplicative difference. And sometimes we also uh, will talk about some, some additive difference. But just thinking back to our intuition is this is basically saying that they, as you fix the behavior of your algorithm on some particular input database, it, in, in, it imposes constraints on the behavior of your algorithm on, on similar databases. OK. And then thinking just since we haven't been thinking about privacy for privacy's sake so much this week, thinking about the perspective of an individual, uh, considering whether or not to submit their data or participate truthfully in a computation who's I, who enjoys th where the computation enjoys a guarantee of differential privacy, the individual might, might be hesitating because of concern about pr particular outcomes or consequences uh, that might occur maybe immediately or down the line as a result of this computation being done. And what differential privacy says to that individual is, well, if you identify those potential bad outcomes and, and think about them and what, what are the odds that they'll occur if you participate in the computation, well, actually, they'll, they'll occur with almost exactly the same probability if you were to withhold or lie about your information. So the stability property um, gives some guarantee to individuals or gives some threat to individuals that about the same things will happen regardless of whether or not you participate. And like I mentioned, we also sometimes talk about this epsilon delta parameterized version of the stability notion <coughs> where we have not just a multiplicative change in the probabilities, but also an additive delta change. And we've seen some properties of the stability notion already, but I'll just remind you of the ones that are most relevant to us today. Uh, so the first of these is post-processing, uh, which just intuitively says that any subsequent computations and the results of a differentially private computation maintain the privacy or maintain the stability. And then the one that we've seen a lot of emphasis on, of course, is this composition notion. Uh, so Intuitively, just to remind you, what composition is telling us is that if we run multiple differentially private algorithms, we can still reason about the overall stability. So uh, very informally, this is a statement that the epsilons and the deltas add up in some sense. And this is very nice for the reasons that we've seen so far this week, but also just because it it allows us to do a very simple privacy analysis, of even of potentially very complex algorithms of related to some of the themes we saw earlier today. And, and this is particularly powerful and gives us sort of the, the nice adaptive data analysis consequences that we've seen earlier uh, because these guarantees of composition hold even if subsequent computations are chosen as a function of previous results. And, um, and so because this is not the focus here, we'll just sort of take, take the, the composition guarantees uh, is given, but this is really sort of what makes differential privacy tick. It's what makes differential privacy such a nice notion is that it lets us build up uh, more sophisticated algorithms from these very simple building blocks. And perhaps the simplest building block and the simplest differentially private algorithm is the Laplace mechanism, which is just, just a name for the direct addition of Laplace noise. So this is a way of achieving a differential privacy guarantee um, on a numeric computation. And so the, the amount of noise that, that you need to add scales with the sensitivity of the computation. So how much that computation can change if you add or remove one person from the input database. And so 
this, this building block is going to be sort of the, the essential building block that we'll need uh, for our discussion today. Um, and all the mechanisms that we'll talk about are built using the Laplace mechanism. So, um, right, so what do we want to do today? Uh, so again, lots of interesting computations on personal data. What are, what are these interesting computations? Well, some examples, and maybe somebody wants to learn to predict what you'll type. Maybe somebody wants to learn to predict what ads you'll click on. Maybe somebody wants to learn to predict what you'll buy. Uh, it's basically, there's a lot of extrapolation um, from lots of data of rules that map individual behavior into specific outcomes. And so a very natural place to start our investigation of thinking sort of accuracy first is to think about differentially private learning and in particular empirical risk minimization. So as you all know, the setting here is that uh, there are true labels from points drawn from an underlying distribution and the learner has access to some training set of label data and they need to pick a hypothesis uh, from some given set to minimize their mistakes in the training set. Um, and hopefully this is going to give us good results on the underlying distribution. And there's been a lot of work on differentially private ERM. Uh, and basically what we're doing here is building on a lot of, a lot of what's going on here. But the, basically, at some level, What's happened is people have thought about all the different places that you can perturb existing ERM algorithms and have tried them all. So you can, you can perturb the data, you can perturb the objective, you can perturb the output, you can perturb the procedure. You can <coughs> basically anywhere you can add the noise in some sense. People have tried to add the noise um, and have analyzed the consequences here and the guarantees uh, for privacy and the impact on the accuracy of these algorithms. And so at some level, it feels like my question has already been addressed. We have all these theorems that talk about privacy, accuracy, trade-offs. Why don't they talk about accuracy, privacy, trade-offs? I mean, isn't that the same thing? Um, and yes, you can take any one of these theorems that you like, and you can flip it. So what do I mean by flip it? So you could take an existing utility theorem and you could solve for the smallest epsilon that achieves whatever accuracy requirement you have in mind. And then you could run your algorithm with the corresponding epsilon and that would achieve what I'm setting out to achieve here. It would be sort of an accuracy first approach uh, to performing privacy preserving empirical risk minimization. And it's, you know, it's a completely sound approach, but it's maybe not as good as it could be. So why not? Well, existing utility theorems are really worst case statements. Um, and algorithms often may provide better accuracy privacy than they promise. It's one of the issues is that we have some sort of sloppy constants that haven't necessarily been, been optimized away. And then maybe sort of the more interesting issue in some sense is that uh, a specific data set or a specific outcome, uh, sort of property of, of the outcome that you actually have on your data, might allow for better privacy utility trade-offs than these worst case theorems would tell you. And so it's possible that you're giving up a lot by just flipping one of these theorems and picking the corresponding epsilon. And the question is, can we ever do better? Um, can we sort of find our way to understanding when there is a better trade-off in our particular situation? So it feels like this ought to be really straightforward. It feels like we ought to be able to just go around trying values of epsilon until we get one that works. Um, and so just try an epsilon. Does this satisfy our accuracy constraint? No, OK. Here's another epsilon. Try, see if it satisfies our accuracy constraint. Oh, oh, that, that was maybe more than we needed. And just sort of search in epsilon space. And that's the basis of, of an idea that works. But there's some problems, some issues with that approach. Um, and the sort of basic issue here is that that search in epsilon space is a data-dependent search. And so if you want to do a careful privacy analysis here, you would have to pay for all of those different epsilons that you tried. 
even though you only in the end used one of them, the path that took you to that epsilon is a costly one. This is not a familiar way of thinking about things if you're not coming from sort of differential privacy perspective and, and feels sort of very overly cautious to make me pay for every epsilon along the way. And the question is, did I really need to pay for all of those epsilons along the way until I found a good one for my accuracy goal? And that's sort of a, a less sort of fundamental issue at some level, but an important one is, is that we don't actually have language to talk about privacy losses that are a function of the data. Uh, so it's not really a priori clear how to bound privacy loss when you do this kind of searching. The search could run for a long time, and then eventually we get some guarantee. How do we talk about that guarantee? So we need a language there for speaking about data-dependent <coughs> privacy guarantees. So basically, the, for the rest of my talk, I'll tell you about how to do a principled version of this epsilon search idea that addresses these issues. Um, basically, what we do is we give you a meta method uh, for doing this search that will be applic applicable to several classes of private learning algorithms. And then I'll show you briefly how this performed. And really, I just want to give you the intuition for how we address those particular issues that came up uh, when I tried to sort of do epsilon search before, uh, and, and then sort of show you that it, it seems to be working and, and a couple of uh, existing issues that remain. So the high-level approach is initially what we'd like to do is we'll compute a very private hypothesis. And then we're going to degrade the privacy of that hypothesis using a doubling approach until the accuracy guarantee is met. So basically, it's going to be this idea of searching in, in epsilon space. But to avoid paying extra, to avoid paying for all of the epsilons that we try along the way, we'll use noise across our rounds that's correlated. So that effectively, you can subtract noise from a previous round to get the next round. And it's going to allow us to avoid paying for each time. And then in order <clears throat> to uh, allow us to check and pay appropriately in terms of privacy, uh, check whether our accuracy guarantee has been met, we come up with a new algorithm uh, to address that issue. And in the end, we're able to only pay the privacy costs of the final hypothesis. So those earlier epsilons you tried are free. But we do have to pay for the checking, the checking at each round whether or not you've actually picked a suitable epsilon in terms of your accuracy goal. OK, so and then we have this issue of how do we talk about these guarantees. Uh, so this approach doesn't satisfy any sort of a priori epsilon differentially private uh, guarantee for any fixed epsilon. But if it terminates after k rounds, it seems to satisfy some sort of bounded privacy loss ex post. And so I, this is related uh, to ideas that come out in this work of Rogers, Roth, Ullman, and Vedan, um, known as privacy odometers. There, the, the goal was to develop a theory of uh, privacy composition uh, when the data analyst can choose the privacy parameters of subsequent computations <coughs> as a function of the outcomes of the previous computations. <coughs> and sort of in this theme, we introduce, <coughs> excuse me, the concept of ex post privacy loss and of ex post differential privacy guarantees. <coughs> excuse me. Where the notion is defined perhaps pretty much as you would expect. So the, we talk about the ex post privacy loss of a randomized algorithm on an outcome. So now privacy loss, it's specific to an outcome of, of the computation. Of the maximum of repairs of neighboring databases of the log of this probability ratio, so just the probability that we select that outcome under the, the one database and the probability if we, that we select that outcome under the neighboring database. And now, <coughs> excuse me, now we can talk about an ex post differential privacy guarantee of an algorithm, and the way we do that is by defining some function uh, that 
maps from outcome space to some sort of <coughs> quantification of the loss. And now we can say that we satisfy this function of outcome, ex post differential privacy, if for all outcomes, our loss is indeed bounded by this function. So now we have a language, at least, for talking about ex post privacy guarantees. Now let's go back to trying to achieve ex post differential privacy. Uh, so, so I mentioned we have this approach that allows us to not pay for every round, which is this notion of uh, correlated noise. So this is an idea that comes out of a paper of uh, Kufugianis, Han, and Papas of this year. And <clears throat> so the algorithm here is that you look at a continuous random walk that starts at your private data, such that the marginal distribution at each point in time is Laplace centered at that, <coughs> that true data, um, with variance increasing over time. And so now we have basically a sequence of points where more private points can be derived from the less private ones. And in order to get what we need, we just need to reverse this process. Okay. And so now we have the ability to run multiple rounds that all enjoy sort of I <coughs> less and less privacy um, and where we can eventually sort of find our way to the, the right level of epsilon without paying for the earlier ones. Okay, so then, then we have this additional question of sort of how do we check whether we're done? How do we check whether or not we've satisfied the correct level of accuracy and say, okay, we can stop? So if you're familiar with the, the literature, there, there's an algorithm that sounds like it's almost the right thing for us here, this, this idea of above threshold, which is just a, a differentially private approach that lets us take a data set in a sequence of adaptively chosen queries and privately output the first query that exceeds a given threshold. Um, and this lets you, is an approach that lets you pay sort of exponentially less than you would have if you paid the composition of the queries. But for us, we have a little bit of a problem, which is that our queries are dependent on the data. And so naively, we'd need to publish and pay for them all. And we, we'd like to avoid doing that, obviously. Uh, so <clears throat> we, <coughs> I don't have time to tell you details, but basically um, we come up with a, a slight, slight tweak on this uh, above threshold algorithm uh, that allows us uh, to handle this particular sort of adaptive query setting. Um, and now we have the pieces that we need to uh, put together as sort of this accuracy, accuracy first approach. So now we have an algorithm that applies actually to any ERM te technique that can be described as a post processing of a Laplace mechanism. Um, so, for example, output perturbation, where you add Laplace noise to the result, <coughs> um, or covariance perturbation, where you're effectively perturbing the data. You're perturbing the covariance matrix of the data and then optimizing using that noisy data. So these are two existing differentially private ERM approaches um, on which you can layer this accuracy first approach. And just in the next few minutes, I want to show you a little bit about <clears throat> how that ended up working. The summary is pretty simple, which is that uh, the approach massively outperforms simply inverting the theory curve. So what I mean is flipping the existing theorems, the corresponding existing theorems. And we also improve on sort of a baseline epsilon doubling approach um, where you actually do the epsilon search but sort of pay for it naively. Um, and so what does this look like? <coughs> so we have a couple of settings that we'll look at. The first one here is a ridge regression setting, um, the prediction of popularity of Twitter posts. And here, so what are we looking at? So we're looking at this plot of the, the excess error guarantee. So this is the, the alpha that we demand, the accuracy that we demand. We're looking at the sort of corresponding ex post privacy loss that we're able to achieve. And we're comparing here a few different things. So here we have the theory curves, both from the covariance perturbation approach and from the output perturbation approach up here. And we have here noise reduction. So just to sort of orient you, uh, privacy loss is bad, being down is good. And uh, the, the thing that to maybe help you interpret, you know, how good is this? The thing to keep in mind is that 
uh, perhaps the natural way to think about privacy risk is actually exponential in the epsilon. Uh, so these gaps are quite substantial in terms of the, the impact on, on privacy risk. And so the, we, we see that there's some promise here uh, that perhaps uh, thinking in a slightly more sophisticated way than just flipping the theory curves can, can get you some benefit um, on a real world problem. We see sort of similar results when we look at another problem, in this case is the logistic regression problem. Um, this is <coughs> uh, characterizing uh, the event, network events as malicious or innocent um, in the KDD 99 cup uh, data set. And so again, here we see, here we just have one sort of theory curve that we're comparing to, but we see a benefit from, from this approach. And then now I want to do the sort of comparison with uh, naive epsilon doubling, where you pay for everything along the way, uh, going back again to the, these two examples. Uh, we, here we see a benefit. It, it feels like it's maybe sort of less of a benefit. It is less of a, of a benefit. But I still want to point out that because of this uh, exponentiation of the epsilon, I, the privacy risk that we see here at alpha of 0.05 is 10 under the noise reduction approach, and it's something like 500 under the doubling approach. So this, these are perhaps significant uh, impacts on the privacy level that we're allowed, to, that we're able to achieve. Um, and similarly, we see, see for the logistic regression case. So I can show you some some other plots, but maybe first I'll sort of wrap up and there are questions we can go, go to the other plots. But basically, I, there are two things that are a little bit unsatisfying here or a little bit surprising here. Um, the first is that I wasn't expecting all, at all that this, the costs in terms of privacy of testing whether or not we'd gotten the accuracy we needed, that that was going to be substantial. But then when we ran these uh, experiments, we saw that testing was really a dominant cost here. And it's possible that this is not real in the sense that we're <clears throat> our empirical approach is driven by sort of using a, a theoretical, theoretical bound on the maximum norm of any hypothesis to compute the sensitivity of the queries. Uh, maybe there's something smarter that you could do there. But I don't really understand why this would be the dominant turn. Uh, that's just what we saw. The, the other thing that's a little bit unsatisfying here is that, so at the beginning I told you, you know, there's epsilon parameterized differential privacy, which is this multiplicative factor. And then you can also do sort of epsilon delta differential privacy, which has these additive uh, sort of slack. And, and the, Doing all of what I just said under epsilon delta differential privacy would have been really natural. Uh, this is sort of what gets used in practice, uh, to the extent that things are used in practice. And uh, you get these nicer accuracy privacy trade-offs under epsilon differential privacy. But we don't know how to prove the interactive above thresholds theorem that we showed uh, for the relaxed notion of differential privacy. And in fact, the theorem that we did prove does not seem to hold uh, for this relaxed notion of differential privacy, basically because you end up having to add up all of these deltas in some terrible union bound that just kills you. And I, I don't know a way around it, but it seems like you ought to be able to say something of this flavor. I just don't know how to do it. I was actually curious if you can also um, can you use this to simultaneously search for uh, alpha and epsilon, <coughs> sort of because where does the accuracy bound come from? Right, it's just as hard as epsilon. Yeah. So, so you mean? Like, what, what do I do if I don't have an alpha bound? I mean, you don't you don't come in a priori with a particular goal of, of alpha, a particular goal of epsilon. You just want to search in in this space and find a sort of good feasible right. trade off. Right. Um, I haven't thought about that. It's very natural, but I think you ought to be able to, to do that. Yeah, um, that, and that makes a lot of sense because you come to these problems not knowing 
what's the fe feasible trade-off? And so, you know, how should you know where you want to be on the trade-off curve until you know the trade-off curve? And so, yeah, that kind of exploration is very natural. Cool. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank all the speakers uh, for today.